Hilcha is Gedushin Perek Shvi'i, the laws of divorce, chapter 7. Today we continue the topic of Shlichut, of agency, as it relates to divorce. Specifically, we're going to discuss two topics. Number one, transferring a divorce document from one country to another and the laws that govern that. And secondly, transferring the actual agency. If an agent becomes sick, if an agent isn't able to carry out his mission, can he hand it off? And how does that work? So without further ado, Halacha Aleph says, Ramam Shliach Shehevi Get Mimokim Lamakim Be'eretz Yisrael. If an agent is transferring a divorce document from place to place within the land of Israel, and we've seen a number of times that halachically the land of Israel is divided into what's called three aratzot, three regions. You have Galil, that's the Galilee, Yehuda is Judea, and Transjordan, Eber Hayarden, is also considered to be part of Israel in regard to many areas of halacha. So if an agent is bringing a get from area to area, or even within one region, from place to place in Israel, even if the agent did not witness the writing of the divorce, and he also doesn't know who the witnesses are that signed it, the husband simply handed him a divorce document, and he said to him, please give this divorce to my wife. All he has to do is give the divorce to the wife in the presence of witnesses, because that's when the actual divorce takes place. Even if us, the court, and uh, the people who are dealing with the divorce on the other end, even if we don't know who the witnesses are, it's okay. The woman is divorced. She can even get married on the basis of this get. By the way, I should point out that Ammam here used the word shliach by default without defining it. Yesterday we saw there's three types of agents. But the Ramam told us yesterday that when he uses the word shliach with no further definition, it's an agent of the man. In other words, an agent of delivery, in which the divorce only takes place when the agent hands it over to the woman. That's why the Ramam is saying it over here. All the, woman, all the agent has to do is hand the divorce to the woman in the presence of witnesses, and it's good. Now, the agent, in this case, did not witness the writing of the get. He also doesn't know who the witnesses are signed on the divorce. So what happens if later, if the husband later on came and protested, and he said, I never divorced my wife. The get shehuva la mezuyafu, and the divorce that was brought to her is actually false. It's counterfeit. Now what you have to do is you have to track down the witnesses who signed on the divorce, and that's the way to verify it. And if indeed they could not verify it and nobody knows who the witnesses are, the woman, if she remarried, must leave the second marriage and any children born from that marriage are mamzerim, are illegitimate children. Because it turns out that the husband never divorced her. If in the meantime the divorce document had been lost, so now there's no way to verify who the witnesses are because we don't know who they are, she is only divorced out of doubt. There's no way to certify, to verify the divorce. Lefichach, therefore, nashim shechezkasam. Shehein soyne zu ezu, the women who halachically have a presumption to resent each other, eine manais lahavi get be'aretz Yisrael zu lezu. Even though a woman, as we learned yesterday, is able to serve as an agent to deliver a divorce, the five, as we're going to see, there's five women who are considered to resent each other, they are not trusted to be an agent to bring a divorce within the land of Israel for each other. Shema mezuyafu, because maybe indeed it's a falsified counterfeit document. But tiskavin and the woman, since she resents this other woman, is actually intending to mess her up. So she will enter a second marriage and thereby become prohibited on the new husband. These are the women that are presumed to resent each other. Pay attention here. In the middle, we have the woman who we're talking about. This is the woman who will potentially be divorced. And there are five women related to her that are presumed to resent her, and she's presumed to resent them. Chamaisa, her mother-in-law. It's the original source for the mother-in-law jokes. We always hate our mother-in-law because that's what it says in the Torah. So the mother-in-law right here, this is, this is her husband, his mother. Ubas Chamaisa, the daughter of the mother-in-law. We call this, in modern English, sister-in-law. Her husband's uh, sister. Truth is, it could be not, not his full sister, it could be his mother's daughter from a different marriage, but the point is that the daughter of the mother-in-law. Vitsarasa, and a co-wife, if she has one. Many times, in early ages, a man would marry more than one wife. So this woman right here is presumed to resent this woman over here. 
Even if currently the co-wife is actually married to somebody else. In other words, there were only co-wives for a while. Then she got divorced and then she's in a different marriage. But at one point in time she was a co-wife with her, she's presumed to hate her. And a woman who could potentially become her fellow co-wife through Yibum, through Leveret marriage. This means that if there's a brother here, let's call this a brother, this is the brother of the woman, and I'm sorry, this is a bit inaccurate here. It should be really on the other side. If the husband has a brother who has a wife and that brother is going to die childless, this wife is going to end up having to marry the brother and she's going to have to suffer in a marriage with her. Even if she happens to be her sister, in which case the Yibum will never actually take place, as we're going to learn in the next set of laws in the Rambam. The point is a woman who could potentially become a Yevama, a shared, and then share a, share a husband with her. Ubas Baila. And the final woman is a stepson. The daughter, step, stepdaughter, excuse me, the daughter of her husband. So all of these women are presumed to be resentful of one another. And therefore, they cannot serve as agents to bring the divorce one to another. But all other women are kosher or fit, are acceptable to be agents for a get. If somebody is an agent to bring a divorce from place to place in the land of Israel, and he can't carry out his mission, he becomes sick, or he's under duress for whatever reason, circumstances beyond his control, he cannot deliver the divorce. Mishal Chebiyad Acher, he is allowed to appoint another agent and send it in his hands. V'chein HaSheni Yimchala, Mishal Chebiyad Acher, if the second agent gets sick, he can pass it on to somebody else. V'afilu Meya, even if it's a chain of a hundred people. V'ein Sarich Eidim Lachzer V'lasa Yishliach B'fnei, there's no need for witnesses to be watching as the second or the third in the chain is being appointed. And the last guy, whoever was appointed last as the agent, and he has the divorce, but his Gaddish boy simply will give the divorce to the woman in the presence of two witnesses, and she will be divorced thereby, and even if not only did the first guy get sick, but he actually died. And so in a way, the link is now broken. The connection between the husband and the, the, the initial agent has been cut off. It doesn't matter, since he appointed another shliach in his lifetime, the shlichut continues. Till now we're talking about an agent bringing a divorce from place to place in Israel. What if he's bringing it from place to place in the diaspora, outside of Israel? Or he's bringing it from Israel to outside of Israel, or from outside of Israel to Israel. Now it's not so simple. In Israel it was very easy. Even if you didn't witness the writing of the get, even if you don't know who the witnesses are, it's okay. Once you're transferring borders, from inside of Israel to outside or the opposite, or within an area outside of Israel, only if the agent was standing there. When the original divorce document was written and signed, then he can say, in the presence of two witnesses, I was present when the get was written. I was present when the get was signed. And then in the presence of those two witnesses in front of whom he's making this declaration, he should hand off the divorce to the woman, but he's got his way and only then will she be divorced. Even if the witnesses that are actually signed on the divorce were not familiar with who they are, as long as the agent can testify to the fact that he was there when the get was written and signed, that's okay. Even if the witnesses signed on the get sound pretty fishy, they have names that are idolatrous, Gentile names. We don't have to worry about them. Again, the agent can testify he was there. That's enough. But he has to say that. Unlike in Israel, where there's no need to say anything, the husband gave you a get, simply deliver it to the destination. When you're dealing with the outside of Israel, it's required that the agent be able to say, I was there when it was written and signed. And in this case, were the husband to come later and protest and say that the get is a forgery, we don't even listen to him. Therefore, here, even those women who are presumed to be resentful of each other, they are believed, trusted, to bring a get for the woman to whom they're presumed to be resentful and to say, I was there when the get was written and signed. 
this is a much higher level of believability, and therefore even those women, we don't, we don't assume that they're out to mess up the other woman. What if you have an agent who's bringing a divorce within Israel where he's not required to take any extra measures, but he does, the Amar, and he says, I can testify to the fact that I was present when the get was written and signed, even though he doesn't have to say that. But he did. If the husband was to come later and protest, we will not listen to what he says. Now, let's return to the main case at hand. We're dealing with a divorce brought into the diaspora. And we're talking about a case where the agent cannot testify to the fact that he was present during the writing and the signing. Here, the agent cannot deliver the divorce to the woman unless he can verify the signatories on the divorce. We have to find out some way that the signatures here are good. The Ramam will describe elsewhere the process of verification. You have to have three judges in front of whom the signatures are verified. The agent can be one of those three judges. If there was no verification on the signatures and the agent nevertheless handed over the divorce to the woman, and again we're talking about a case outside of Israel, and the divorce is rabbinically disqualified until it can be verified. And if indeed the husband will come and protest, and they won't be able to verify it, just like in Israel, so to another diaspora, she will not be divorced. Also like in Israel, if the divorce is lost, she will be now only divorced out of doubt, because there is no way to conclusively verify the signatures on the document, for it is lost. What is the reason for this distinction? Why did the sages require that an agent be able to say, I was present during the writing and the signing? Why does he have to say that when he's delivering a divorce in the diaspora? It's a protection for women's rights. Just in case the husband later comes and protests that the get is a forgery, she won't then have to verify the signatures. It's very difficult to access witnesses from place to place in the diaspora. In Israel, by contrast, people travel all the time. There's always witnesses who can verify the signatures of other witnesses, and so we're never worried about that. But in the diaspora, if the husband's going to come and protest, the woman's going to, it's going to be on her to verify the signatures on the divorce. It's going to be extremely difficult to trace down the witnesses outside of Israel. And what will end up happening probably is that divorce will be nullified. We don't want that. And so we require the agent to be there, deliver that testimony that he was there, and thereby avoid the need to later on verify the signatures on the divorce. What if the get was delivered in the diaspora? The agent said as he was supposed to, I was present during the writing and the signing. In which case, usually, if a husband follows that up with a protest, we don't listen to him. But what if he brought clear proof? The husband protests that it's a forgery and he brings proof that it's a forgery. And then, of course, he can't deny the facts. The divorce is nullified. The only reason the sages lended credibility to the words of a single witness, the agent, who is saying that I saw the divorce written and signed, the only reason we gave it credibility was insofar as only to be strong enough to push away a, pro a, a protest of a husband when there's no accompanying proof. But if there were, let's say, witnesses that are denying the facts. Husband can bring actual witnesses that the divorce is a forgery. No, the sages didn't give credibility that far to the agent's word that I was present during the writing and the signing. Agent versus the husband, if it's his word against his, we believe the agent. But if the husband has proof, we believe the husband. Let's talk about some places that it's questionable whether they're part of Israel or not. The rivers in Israel. And the small islands in the Mediterranean Sea, adjacent to the land of Israel, kind of right over here. Classic today would be like Cyprus. If they're within the border of the land of Israel, they are considered like the land of Israel. And all the laws of agency will apply in Israel, equally apply in those islands. But if the islands are considered to be outside of the border of Israel, then they're treated like, of course, the diaspora. 
what does it mean that the borders of Israel? So the Rambam says you'll have to wait. In the seventh book of the Rambam, in the laws of Truma, I'm going to explain the borders and how the borders of Israel work. Essentially, what the Rambam is going to say is that you can see that Israel on the border of the Mediterranean kind of goes down in a little bit of a circular border. So what happens is at this point here, where it reaches the point of the border with the other country on land, you would draw a straight line that would reach all the way up to the top of the border here in the north, and any part of the sea that's within that straight line is considered to be part of Israel. There are other opinions that are actually pretty extreme and say that the line goes actually outward as well. It extends to the west, and anything in the western area of the Mediterranean uh, on a much bigger scale will be included in Israel, but we'll see more about that in the seventh book of the Rambam. Ubavel ke'eretz Yisrael legitin. The Rambam says the entirety of Babylonia, which was the mainstay of Torah after the exile, after the destruction of the temple, is considered to be like Israel with regard to divorce. Because this isn't just a ge geographical issue. It's also a technical issue. The idea behind differentiating between Israel and the diaspora is that in Israel it's very easy to track down witnesses, and in the diaspora it's not. In Babylonia, since it was the mainstay of Torah, people were constantly traveling there, and it was also very easy to track down witnesses over there. So there was no issue of that in Babylonia, and therefore it's treated like Israel, and if an agent brings a divorce within Babylonia, he doesn't have to say that he was there during the, the, the writing and the signing. If a divorce was written in Israel and signed outside of Israel, we require the agent to say that he was there during the writing and the signing. In other words, it's treated like a divorce in a diaspora. If they wrote the divorce outside of Israel and it was signed in Israel, there's no need for the agent to say that he was there present during the writing and the signing because it was signed in Israel. In other words, we go after the place of the signing. What if the divorce was only partially written in the presence of the agent? It was fully signed in his presence, but only partially written. If it was the first part, and let's remind ourselves what the divorce document looks like. This is an actual divorce document. And so let's say the first couple of lines were written in his presence. The agent is already based on that allowed to say that I was present when it was written and signed. Even if only one line, the top line, which has the date, was written in his presence. Even if all he heard was the voice of the feather stroking against the parchment. He didn't actually see the writing, he only heard it. The chasmu ha'edim befana and the signatures were done by the witnesses in his presence. Actually, that already qualifies, and he can say, "I was present when it was written and signed." The chaynim yatsa sefer lashuk. The chazar vihishlim esaget. Similarly, if the agent was there the entire time of the writing, but the scribe left, he left the room, went to the market, in the middle of writing the divorce, and came back and finished it. We don't have to worry that in the interim, somebody met the scribe and told him, you know what, I want you to write the divorce for my wife. And perhaps he had in mind for a different woman. And this is a big issue of Lishma, we saw in the earlier chapters, that the divorce must be written with the express intent for the man and the woman who are going through the divorce. So perhaps when the scribe left the room, he met another man who had the same names and the same wife's name as the, as the case at hand. And maybe the agent is now handing over a divorce that was written without the proper intent. No, you don't have to worry about that. The agent can say, I was present, it was written and signed in front of me. What if the agent, all he can say is, it was written in front of me, but it wasn't signed in front of me. Or it was signed in front of me, but not written in front of me. I watched the entire writing, and I watched one of the witnesses sign, but I didn't watch the second witness sign. Or even if he was, the second witness. So in a way it was signed in front of him because he signed it himself. We don't trust the witness's word. He has to verify the signatures of the actual witnesses and only then can he hand off the divorce. We don't believe him just based on his words. But if he and somebody else can testify, they themselves can verify the second witness's signature which he says was not signed in front of him. That's enough. Since he saw one of the witnesses sign the divorce, and the other one he can produce witnesses who know that it's his signature, that's kosher. 
Certainly, if two other people from the market can come and verify the signature of the second witness, that's certainly a kosher divorce. If two people brought a divorce, two people were serving as agents. They're bringing a divorce in the diaspora. Even if it wasn't written and signed in their presence, since the husband appointed them both to give the divorce to his wife, they should give it to her and she'll be divorced with no further questions. Because what's the reason why we make the, the agent say that it was signed in his presence, perhaps the husband will come later and protest. But here where he had two people be the agents, he can never come later and protest. Even if it won't be verified by the signatories. Because the two agents become the witnesses to effectuate the divorce. And that, that's it, there's no more room for protest after that. And general, if two people come to, the, come to the court and say, you know what, we watched a woman get divorced. You have two witnesses, that's super powerful. There's always the divorce status falls upon the woman, even if there is no document to produce, because two witnesses are believed beyond everything. So by appointing the two, the two people as his agents, he has basically appointed witnesses who will always work against his protest. So there's no need for these agents to say, we watched the divorce be signed and written. When do we say this leniency? If they're both holding on to the divorce. But if they aren't both equally producing the divorce document, they do have to say that it was written and signed in front of us, because if only one of them is holding on, then the husband can say, hey, it's just my word against yours. It's not my word against two. Therefore, if it's a combined effort, one of them says, I saw the writing. One of them says, I saw the signing. Or two people are saying, we watched the writing, two out, of the, two out of the two, and only one out of the two can attest to the signing, and the other one cannot. Since in this case, not both of them are producing the divorce fully, you can only give the woman the divorce until after you verify the signatures of those who signed it in the document. If one of the two witnesses are saying, I saw the writing, but both of them are attesting to the signing, kosher, then it's kosher, even if they aren't producing the actual divorce document, the very fact that both witnesses attested to the signing is already establishing the veracity of the signatures. And so, that kind of seals the deal and allows for the divorce to go forward. A, a agent brings a divorce in the diaspora and simply hands off the divorce to the wife privately. Or he gives it in the presence of two people, but either way, he never said the key words. I attested. I can attest to the signing and the writing. Even if she got married as a basis on, that, on the basis of that divorce, the, the, the idea is that it can always be rectified. We don't say, because he didn't say it in the beginning, if she gets married, it's an illegal marriage. No, all he has to do is take the divorce back, give it back to her in the presence of two people, and actually say those key words, I saw it signed and I saw it written. But if he never took it back, then indeed, the divorce remains rabbinically disqualified unless you can prove the veracity of the signatures. And if not, the second marriage is problematic. He gave her the divorce. And he didn't have a chance to say those key words that I, could, I saw the writing and the signing. He didn't have a chance to say it. He became mute. Maybe there was a massive earthquake. He got shocked. Something happened. He couldn't continue talking. Too bad. He couldn't say the words. Now we have to revert to the other option. We have to establish the veracity of the signatures and only then can we give her the divorce. Based on this whole chapter, we understand obviously that a blind person can never be an agent to bring a divorce in the diaspora. He can never say, I watched the signing and the writing. Therefore, if the divorce was written and signed in front of him when he was able to see, and then later he became blinded, he can testify in front of a court of three judges that I saw it signed and sealed, signed and written, 
and he can handle the divorce because at least when he saw it, he was, he was, uh, he was a seeing person. When it was written, he was a seeing person. Similarly, if a woman brings the divorce from the diaspora, I didn't stress the point before with the blind person, unlike a regular agent who has to only say, I saw it right, written and sealed in front of two witnesses, the blind person has to say it in front of three, in front of a full court. So the Ramam says, now the chain. Similarly, a woman who brings a divorce also needs to have three people to say in front of them, I saw it written and signed. When do they allow to just say it in front of two people if the agent can serve as a witness? Because then he combines with the two witnesses. He is part of the court of three who are verifying this divorce. Because we have a principle that even though usually a witness cannot ascend to the bench, he cannot become one of the judges sitting on the case, when it comes to rabbinic matters, an, a witness can. So since the whole idea of the agent saying that I watched the writing and the signing is rabbinic enactment, so here the agent can himself become one of the judges on the court who will allow for the divorce to go forward. But if it's a woman or if it's a blind person who cannot serve as a witness, so then you have to have three other people in the presence of whom she'll say that she watched the writing and the signing, and then the divorce can be handed off. This is now in the case of the diaspora. We already talked about when an agent gets sick or under duress in Israel. Over there, you can just hand off the shlichut one to another. It's okay, the chain continues. But in the case of the diaspora, if an agent becomes ill or he's under duress beyond his control, he needs to come to a court and testify. Get zeb if I nichtav, I nechtam. I watch the writing and the signing of this divorce. I simply cannot send it off because I'm too sick, or I am being forced otherwise. And they will send it off to another agent. And of course, the second agent need not say. He also can't say that I watched the writing and the signing. They're already the first one already entered that claim into the court. It's on the court's record. It's okay. All he has to say is, I'm the agent of the court. And hands off the divorce in front of witnesses. If the second agent also gets sick, or he's also forced beyond his control, he cannot carry out the mission. He also goes to the court and creates another link in the chain in the court. And here, even here too, the chain can go on even to 100 people. The last guy who has the final divorce, he has to say, I'm an agent of the court, and hands it off to the woman, and the divorce goes into effect. Even again, even if the first agent dies, the link of the shlichut continues. How come in these cases of the diaspora, you have to have a court? Only because the first agent has to say that he watched the divorce be written and signed. But if there was another way out of it, if the, if the signatures on the divorce had already been verified, through other means, even if one shliach handed it off to the next agent, even a hundred times, <laughs> privately, until finally the divorce reached the woman's hand, that is a kosher, it's kosher. Even if the husband ever gave the explicit instruction and said, you know what, if you're under duress, you can hand it off to another guy, you take the action into your own hands. It's very logical. If you're sick, or under the rest, hand off the get to somebody else. <laughs> Whenever a person makes an agent for get delivery, there's no need for the agent himself to be in the court. He can tell them, so and so is my agent, even if it isn't in his presence. An agent can appoint a second agent without the person's being present, even if there are a hundred. A man gives a divorce to his wife, and it's written and signed in front of her. The Amar La, and he tells her, I don't want to give you the divorce, now you're going to be divorced. I want you to bring it to a court. You become my agent for delivery, till court number X. They're going to make an agent, they're going to give you the divorce, and that's how you're going to be divorced. Either this is a guy's a cruel husband, he wants to just drive his wife crazy, or he wants to have an actual court record of the divorce. He tells her, listen, I'm going to give you the divorce. You become my agent. You're an extension of me. Bring it to the court. They'll appoint another agent who will then give it to you on my behalf. She can serve 
in the capacity of agent. She also believed to say that she watched a divorce being written inside. And they follow the instructions, they take the divorce, give it to an agent, and he gives it to her, as the husband had instructed. When do we say that this is allowed? When the husband made the stipulation. But if he never made the stipulation, he simply gave her the divorce. And she's now holding the divorce document. Nothing more is necessary. She doesn't have to say anything else. I watched the get being signed. She has the get. She's always presumed to be divorced. The get should be divorced. The divorce is written properly. The witnesses are signed, and it's all, it's all good. And even if we don't know the handwriting of the witnesses, we never verified it. We don't have to worry that a woman falsified, forged. She would never cause her own destruction. If it's a forged get and she gets married to someone else, there's going to be mamzerim coming out of this marriage. Why would you do that? We would believe her if she's holding the divorce. But furthermore, halachically, when there's witnesses signed on a court, on a document, they're considered innocent until proven guilty. They're considered to be already investigated by the court and good. Unless somebody comes and protests. Therefore, if she's holding a divorce document and it's signed, we can keep the divorce in its presumed state allow her to get married, with no worries that perhaps later it's going to be revealed that it's forged. The same way anytime there's an agent. We always presume the divorce to be kosher. We don't presume that it's false. Until there can be a protest of the husband, somebody can prove it, that it's forged or canceled. Because if we do worry about such things, if we're always suspicious that perhaps there's a forgery, perhaps there's a, there's a falsification, then every time, even if there's a husband and a wife, no agent in the middle, husband comes to the court and we watch him hand the divorce to his wife, we should also worry. Maybe he canceled it. We saw yesterday. There's, a whole, there's, a, there's an allowance for a husband to later on cancel the power of his divorce. Maybe in his mind he canceled it or somebody, to somebody else before. He canceled it, and then he's given the divorce. Maybe the, the witnesses are, are, are disqualified. It's counterfeit from within. Maybe it was written with other proper intent. We can always worry about more things if we want to find stuff to worry about. The same way we don't worry about for such things. Anything like it. We keep it on its presumption. Innocent until proven guilty. It's kosher until proven that it's cancelled. There's no need to worry about the people either. Not about the agent status, not about the woman status, if she's holding the divorce. Because laws governing prohibitions are very different than laws governing financial and monetary issues. Financial and monetary issues, not so simple. We don't always say innocent until proven guilty. But when it comes to prohibitions, like marriage and divorce matters, we do apply that rule of cheskas kashrus, of the, pre- of the presumption of being kosher, and we don't have to worry about the divorce, nor about the status of the people involved in delivering it.